and welcome to our program. Today we'll be interviewing Marjorie Hasepian Dopkin. Um, Mrs. Dopkin is an author and uh, has been for many years a professor of English and associate dean at uh, Barnard College. The Smyrna 1922, the destruction of a city. Um, now, could we point out for the audience exactly uh, where on this map Smyrna is located to get us an idea where, we're, where we are in the world and where Smyrna is located? Right here. Okay. And we have a map that is sort of the old world. I would say this is, um, uh, as I say, uh, the age, age of Charlemagne. It, it's uh, back before before the okay. year 1000, but, it's in but uh, Smyrna hasn't moved. It's okay. been there forever. Right. It's where Homer was said to have been born there, you know. Right. And uh, of course now Smyrna is uh, uh, located in uh, the uh, country of Turkey, which is present-day Turkey, Right. and it is called Izmir, I believe. Right. right. Um, now, the title of your book is, is, is uh, I would say, quite dramatic, Smyrna, 1922, the de destruction of a city. Now, could you re relate a little bit of, uh, of the facts behind the destruction of the city? Uh, what was going on in 1922 that uh, surrounding the events of this destruction? In 1922, September, when this fire broke out and really broke out, it was set ablaze. When that happened, it was about a week after the triumphant armies of Mustafa Kemal marched into Smyrna and uh, def they had defeated the Greeks in the Greco-Turkish War that followed World War I. And uh, that was it. The Greek army was evacuated in on Greek ships and uh, there were many Greek refugees from the interior in the city at the time. There was mayhem after the first day or two. And uh, on the 9th of September, the uh, I think that was when the Turks came in. My dates are a little rusty because mm -hmm. I haven't looked the... But somewhere around the 14th of September, the city was in flames. Now, who were the inhabitants of Smyrna at this time, 1922? In 1922, uh, there was a population of approximately 250,000 Greeks who were there and had been there for many, many centuries. Uh, they had, unlike the Pontus Greeks, they, which is these Greeks up here near, on Trebizond on the Black Sea, they had not been there perhaps since ancient Greek, the days of ancient Greece, but they had been there at least until the, bef well, way before the fall of Constantinople and probably way before the arrival of the Turks uh, from North, North Central Asia. And uh, there were about 25 to 30,000 Armenians, a small Jewish uh, community in Smyrna of about 10,000, somewhere around eight to 10,000. And then, at the time that Kemal marched in, there were another 200,000 Greeks who had fled to Smyrna on the heels of the retreating Greek army. So there were about 400,000 plus of Greeks. Well, the Turkish quarter uh, was on, at the back of the city, and that was, I have no idea really how many Turks, but we do know that the Greeks were in the majority. The Greeks were in the majority. Now, how is it that uh, the Greek army was in this area in the first place? This is after the Second World War. This is 1922. What is the Greek army doing in what is now called present-day Turkey? In 1919, May, the Council in Europe, which is the Council of the Great Powers who had won World War I, that is, the United States, Wilson was there, Clemenceau for France, uh, two representatives from Italy, and uh, Venizelos because Greece was also on the winning side. Uh, they were meeting in, and of course Lloyd George for England, mm -hmm. uh, Great Britain, they were meeting in Paris to decide the terms of the peace. They were very hung up on a Carthaginian peace, which is what Clemenceau particularly wanted against the Germans. Uh, 
However, they were also supposed to be going to talk about what was going to happen with Turkey, who was also one of the losers. And at this time, it was it actually called Turkey, or was it called it was the Ottoman? Called, uh, well, there was a sort of interim Ottoman government. The empire had pretty much disintegrated by the time the war ended. This area was, in fact, part of the Ottoman Empire. In, in ancient, uh, not ancient, but until 19... Uh, the war broke out, yes. and for some time after, it was thought of as the Ottoman Empire. After the the disasters uh, and the they lost the war, they had an interim government. They brought back the Sultan, and I guess they still called themselves the Ottoman Empire. But mm -hmm. the empire wasn't there; wasn't too much of it left. Uh, the no, I, uh, I, Greeks were allowed. I ask one one. Uh, well, it's in my mind uppermost. How if they lost the war? How was it that they were able to acquire uh, enough arms? to um, uh, present themselves as a formidable force in that area. Well, if I could just go back and explain why the Greeks were there. Oh, in right. 1919, the Council in Europe authorized Venizelos to go and take over the Smyrna region and uh, Smyrna, the city of Smyrna, mm -hmm. because they were afraid of the Italians uh, coming up and occupying Smyrna. The whole big problem was that both both Greece and Italy had been promised as a, a reward for entering the a war, war the region of Smyrna. War booty. Right. They had both been promised. They had both this been is promised. by the English and the French. Right. And the Russians, who of course were also one of the Allies until they declared a separate peace in 1917 during their revolution. Now, was the United States a party in par to this? Uh, uh, the United States fought agreement? was uh, in 1917, just as Turkey was getting ready to get out of the war. Uh, the United States came into the war, but only against declared war against Germany. Did ne never declared war against Turkey. That was because our many missionary interests there said, "Please don't. We want to be able to be on hand and pick up the pieces of the uh, Armenians and refugees who had been." So badly treated. So then you would say directly after World War I, the biggest players in the area, which is now called Turkey, would be the British, the French, uh, the Italians, and the Greeks. They were, yes, but America suddenly began to get very much interested in the mm -hmm. oil of Mesopotamia, ah, which then ah, belonged to Turkey. Ah, ah. And so. Could you uh, point to what is it? Well, Mesopotamia would be pretty much. Well, I think uh, it would be south. I mean, south, it's, uh, yeah. this is Syria so, here. Yes. And so Mesopotamia is somewhere like. So the, in oil, here. the oil fields extended from that area on into what we now call. Well, so, th so that the Ottoman Empire, you see, at yes. that point took in right. a lot of this. So American oil interests then became. Uh, particularly uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey. Uh, uh. Particularly when Harding came in as president in 1920 and his secretary of state what had been the um, first vice president of Standard Oil. And they were incredibly much interested in expanding into the Middle East. They had never done that before. Mm -hmm. And this was their chance. You know what happened after World War I. They had this great thirst for oil all over the world. There was uh, the, all the ships, all the navies of the world were changing from coal, coal to oil. To oil the right. automobile had come out, the airplane, they just needed oil desperately oh, and so the Americans fearful that they would run out of oil in the states decided they wanted to get into the this end of the game mm -hmm. over here mm -hmm. okay so now I have an idea of what was occurring there politically and uh, um, so we see that the Greeks and and the Italians were promised Smyrna they were promised Smyrna and it's a little complex they weren't first of all the Greeks were Venizelos was not the ruler, if you remember. Mm -hmm. When the war broke out, the, uh, the Kaiser, actually, I think the Kaiser's sister was the wife of the King of Greece. And uh, he, he didn't want to go to war. He played yes. neutral. Yes. Venizelos wanted to go to war. Yes. Venizelos was in exile pretty much in, um, uh, on the island of Crete, I think. Mm -hmm. And he had declared his kind of a coup in Crete, but he was not in power in Greece. And he was sort of playing with the Allies, trying to show that he was on their side, he would come in, and they said, okay, if you come in, you will be given the Smyrna region, which is predominantly Greek. 
and that will be yours. So it was essentially and, one man who sort of involved Greece in the First World well, War. Well, he didn't involve them. Uh, I think that he simply waited. Well, he did, yes. He wanted to get in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, with good reason. He had a lot of people there to protect. Now, the king did not want to get in. Yes. When he staged a coup and when the whole thing went over to Venizelos became the leader, mm -hmm. he came into the war on the side of the Allies. So there was a coup in Greece that de yeah. dethroned the king in right. essence. And, Venezuelos and, had, took power right. and he involved in the, the uh, Greek military. And he came in. But before that, the Italians had been then turned to when Venizelos didn't, uh, couldn't because he wasn't leader yet. Yes. The Allies had turned to the Italians and said, look, you need more arable land. Uh, your population is growing too fast and too big for your, uh, that's the reason that the Italians needed this area. So they wanted right. to so get in there. Okay. So they said, okay, you can have it. Then in the end, when the Greeks came in, Venizelos didn't know about the fact that they had also then yes, later promised it Italy, yes. uh, by treaty, actually, uh -huh. uh, with the Italians. So when Russia got out of the war, became a communist country, they blew the whistle on these what they called capitalist allies. Mm -hmm. and they said, look, look at the kind of deals they make. They promised the same region to both countries. And this was quite a shock. It got so messy that the allies simply didn't want to even touch that. So they waited until 1920s three or four to make a peace treaty with the Turks. Meantime, everything changed. Oh, now what I want to specifically uh, zero in on is as there were Greek forces now in what is now called Turkey, Right. Uh, these forces were met battle with uh, Turkish forces. Yes, the Turkish, the Turks were so outraged that the Greeks had landed, mm -hmm. even though the Greeks had landed not simply on their own authority, but at, with the authority of the Allied powers, okay. except for Italy, who was a little miffed about that, because mm -hmm. uh, they wanted that region. So that's one reason they were landed. In fact, the Greeks were landed to prevent the Italians from coming up and uh. grabbing it. Now, once they landed, they set up a, a, a regime there that was incredibly fair. And they say that the Turks were treated fa almost so fairly because the Steriades, who was the head of the government there, was so bent over backwards to be fair to everyone so that the, some of the Greeks got upset that he was treating the Turks too well. But what happened is that the Turks were so outraged that up here where Ataturk had rounded up a rebel army to start fighting the Armenians, who had yes. been promised a whole lot of land after mm -hmm. World War I. Promised by whom? By the, allies. by the Allies. The, the allies, allies promised. Were promising they were promising. They were ready everyone. to break up the entire yeah. Ottoman Empire. Uh -huh. Now, since the Armenian lands took in a good deal of Turkey mm -hmm. and would cut the heart out of Anatolia, yes. uh, the Turks were outraged, uh -huh. and they began to make great propaganda to allege mm -hmm. that the Greeks had killed I mean, I think there was a fight, and about 100 people or 200 were killed after the Greeks landed. And many of those were Greeks who were killed. Do they land because in the Smyrna Italians in led a, pardon? Do they land in Smyrna in particular, the port of Smyrna? Yes, they landed in they landed Smyrna, in Smyrna, and they were supposed to regulate the only forces, Smyrna. The, the but, but the Greeks uh, started to fan out yeah. because the Turkish irregulars, they called them, sort of bandit armies mm -hmm. who had uh, been either discharged or run up in the hills during the war to avoid conscription. Yes. They came down and they started fighting, uh, killing Greek villagers in the villages beyond. And the Greeks asked for permission to fan out and protect their people. Yes. And even before the permission came, they had fanned out. So before you knew it, this led to a full-fledged war between the Greeks and the Turks. Ah, I see. That's how. That, that's the Greco-Turkish -Turk war. That became the Greco-Turkish war. And at one point, the uh, uh, Greeks had to retreat. Uh, at the well, they were winning for a while there, and uh, yes. they, when they began to approach Constantinople, that's when the Allies got terribly upset, mm -hmm. and they. Immediately, the British sent out uh, a general who stopped them, who stopped the Greek army and sent them back. 
and that was a great reversal for the because they would have got one you know yeah, the great like I say, were, when you say stops I, I find it difficult to, uh, to he imagine. sent out these troops and they just stopped the Greek army and said we will start a war he with sent you out British troops yep Ah, so they, were, they were, I think, African troops or some oh, one of the uh, colonial the troops. Flag right. Saying you go no further. That's all they said. Harrington, I think the general's name was, and, then, and he stopped them from okay, taking. Okay. And then how did that uh, 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 that particular process then uh, allow the Turkish army to be successful in battle against? Well, the when the was one of the main things that happened after World War One was the great desire for the British. Mm -hmm. people to have their boys come home and so they evacuated so quickly that they left enormous dumps of ammunition mm -hmm. which then the Turkish armies under Ataturk which were yes. consolidating yes. began to pick up and they had all the armies the war goods that the British left behind yes. and, and the French those, and, and everyone yes. and who, with, with those munitions and guns and uh, they were much better armed than the Greeks uh, and they began to, uh, the tide of the battle began to turn right and, and the, the battle were in retreat right and it turned even more when Venizelos you know there was a coup against Venizelos eventually and uh, the King Constantine came in if you remember the royalists came into power yes, yes. now one of the main things that the royalists that the poor Greeks had been at war in the Balkan Wars and then came World War mm -hmm. One and they'd been fighting and then came the Greco-Turkish War yes. and the Greeks were fighting and they fighting were they, were they were exhausted and one of the big reasons I think why Venizelos uh, was put down is because this war was dragging on and on what I've never been able to understand is why uh, Constantine didn't quit uh, he kept the war going once he took over the Allies said... Constantine being... The king, the king. of Greece. Okay. The Allies said that they had absolutely no obligation to Constantine. Venizelos, yes, we had sent him in, they said, but not to Constantine. So at that point, whatever even moderate support mm -hmm. they were unwillingly giving or oh. verbally giving, okay. they even withdrew that and they withdrew right. all the loans that they had promised to okay, Greece. So Greece was pauperized. I'm yeah. getting a good idea of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Now I could see that the Greek forces were retreating, and they did they, this retreat focused then uh, uh, on leaving uh, Turkey through Smyrna, through the port yes, of Yes, because somehow they were fighting here, and they started running toward the only port that they could run to, which was this one at now, Smyrna. In, in their, in their it's very close to some of the Greek islands, too. In their retreat, in the retreat of the Greek army, were they involved with any uh, atrocities against the native Turkish peoples? Uh, uh, there had retreat? been so many atrocities by Turks on Greeks that mm -hmm. when the Greeks were leaving and they were... Uh, uh, I think that there definitely were atrocities yeah. as they ran through the villages. Right. One of the things, however, that has to be borne in mind is that they didn't really have time to linger very long. Mm -hmm. So if they burned villages, if they uh, stopped and killed people, it was not a prolonged thing. I'm not excusing it in any mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. The uh, consul, General Horton, our American consul, yes said, and this is an in important statement, I think, he said there is a great difference between an army that has been deserted by its officers, who kind of left the men to fend for themselves, uh, who have witnessed uh, all of these terrible things having been done to their, their own people by the enemy. The enemy is one, and there's a very big difference between any atrocities they may commit and that of a victorious army that enters a city uh, saying we have won and then proceed to systematically and over a period of a couple of weeks kill all the people there. Well, it, it's, uh, it's a matter of historical record that Smyrna was in fact destroyed in 1922. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, your thesis is that, uh, uh, based upon uh, extensive research I made at, I was reading the bibliography uh, of, the, of your book, Smyrna, 1922, The, the Destruction of a City, and I see that you uh, have in your bibli bibliography, you include, include approximately 113 book titles, uh, uh, five pamphlets, uh, 20 eyewitness reports, uh, 26 articles, 
and ten official journals. Now, so I, I would say well, as well as the research. archives. The archives are incredibly important. The uh, documents, the actually official documents in the American archives. Uh -huh. I went into the uh, State Department archives and the Navy Department archives uh, for reasons I can go into, uh, and also an the Library of Congress. Research, based upon the extensive research, you unequivocally say that it was the Turks who burned the city and not the Greeks. No question. No question whatever. The, the Greeks... Uh, Could you pull out some of those sources now just for the listening audience that would really incriminate the Turks rather than the Greeks in this, in this uh, uh, destruction of the city, which included primarily Greeks, majority Greeks, Arm uh, Armenian uh, uh, community, and also a Turkish community. There are even some Turks. There was one notable Turk who said, why are we burning Smyrna? You know, and of course now the Turks who have never admitted that mm -hmm. they burned Smyrna mm -hmm. uh, and have said occasionally they say the Armenians burned it with the help of the Greeks yeah, and, and sometimes it's say, and the Greeks say, with the help of the Armenians. In fact, they say, uh, to the best of my recollection, that the fire is started in the Turkish uh, 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 quarter and that was started by Greeks and then it spread to the city in general. Well, it, so it, the, the, the Turkish quarter was the only part of Smyrna that was not touched. Uh, and that's that. because after they systematically went house by house. Mm -hmm. Now, first thing Ataturk did when he came in was to drop leaflets all over the city by airplane mm -hmm. uh, saying that no civilians were to be touched or molested in any way, that he had given orders to his army and they were not to touch them. So relax everyone, so everyone began to relax, particularly because there was an enormous concentration of Navy ships as well as merchant ships in Smyrna Harbor. Smyrna has a magnificent uh, crescent-shaped harbor from ancient days. That's why it was such a terrific uh, trading yeah, port. There. It's quite and it really gorgeous. It's quite and uh, that's really why the Navy had all come there to, at the end of this thing, to be on hand to protect their nationals. Now, I have to say that when you asked me, and I neglected to tell you, that there was also a lot, a, a vast concentration of Europeans. Huh. And Europeans from the days of Queen Elizabeth I, when trade had started with uh, between the Ottoman Empire and European countries. I think she was one of the first, but there were some with the uh, oh, Vikings even, you know, before that. But it, from those times on, the, the agreement with the Ottomans was that since the Christians were not treated very well in the native Christians, that is the Greeks and the Armenians and the, some Assyrians, a small group of them who were Copts, they were treated rather, they were left on to their own devices and this is a big thing is made out of this, of how very, very wonderfully they treated the Armenians and Greeks because they had autonomy. Well, they did, except when it came to dealings with Turks, they had, their word was not admissible in a Muslim court. So if a Turk came and killed your wife or took her away, you had no recourse. With Muslims, you had no recourse. Between each other, if you had a fight with other Greeks or other Armenians, then you went to your own little uh, government there. Yes, yes. So, and, and the Jews, too. They had their own little government, but not in dealings with Ottomans, which mm -hmm. is a big handicap. They could not bear arms and couldn't defend themselves in any way. All right, so because of this situation, when a European came and was living there to establish trade with the Orient or from the, through Turkey to Europe, they made what they called the capitulations. The capitulations were that the Ottoman government would not extract taxes from them of any sort, would allow them to have diplomatic immunity and to take up matters that had to do with Muslims in their own courts, and that in perpetuity to down to your great 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 forever your children and even if you married a greek or an armenian your children and their children continue to be citizens of england or france or whatever country uh, and for this reason they had made incredible fortunes there they didn't pay 
taxes either to their home countries or to the Ottoman Empire. And they lived there like kings. They had magnificent mm. suburbs. Uh, there was, they had their own country clubs. They had tennis clubs. They had racehorses. Uh, they had many servants. And they had the most beautiful homes at the waterfront. And they, that was burned out, too. And uh, you're, you're they are eyewitnesses. You're asking me, eyewitnesses. Are, you're asking me yes. who, who's the eyewitnesses. Uh, yes. Not yes. only are these European natives uh, who survived the fire eyewitnesses, but their governments, the consuls of all of those countries, and they're because they were so many of these Europeans uh, and Americans by this time. We had Standard Oil Company depots in Smyrna at, by this time. And they were, uh, we landed, uh, we landed Marines, shore patrol, to protect those interests. We had incredibly uh, large tobacco interests. The American Tobacco Company had large factories and, and a depot there to ship out. And we had a lot of merchant shipping. So all of these people, including, oddly enough, the Standard Oil Company chairman who was on hand, he witnessed this. He went back to Constantinople and he said, to Admiral Bristol, who was acting as the chief diplomatic officer official for the United States, I used to be pro-Turk. Well, all the oil people were pro-Turk because they wanted to make points with Kemal and get into those oil fields of Mesopotamia. I, uh, but I he wanted, said, I, I, I now know what after what I saw, I can't deal with those people. Okay, apropos of what you're saying, and you mentioned uh, a lot of high officials. I also here. interviewed sailors, by the way, well, that this, I tried. I, I just want to read a portion. Uh, it's page 15 of your book. Okay. Because you, you, you um, have sources who, uh, who had some sort of significant power in that area. But this is a, an eyewitness uh, uh, interview you had with a Mr. Nino Russo, who was in Freeport, Long Island at the time. And he was, uh, um, and you say, I was happy to obtain an Italian uh, view. Uh, a youthful 80, year old, 80 years old when I spoke with him, Russo had been a ship's en engineer on the Italian battleship Vittorio Emanuele, which had sailed into Smyrna Harbor just before the fires were beginning to break out at various points in the city. Russo spoke with the same intense feeling he had most uh, uh, as had most of the American uh, seamen I interviewed. The heat at one point was so strong, he confirmed, that even though his large ship stood at a considerable distance from the shore, it had to move back. The Italians had come in to pick their own nationals, but they, uh, sent, out, but they sent out 20 lifeboats and picked up anyone within range without asking who was or who was not Italian. There were so many bodies in the water, you couldn't count everybody, he says. All the big shots, the captain, all those going back and forth to shore, they knew and they reported that the, that the Turks were burning Smyrna. Yeah. There was no. a Japanese ship, I should mention, that yeah. was a, a merchant ship, and they threw cargo overboard to pick up uh, refugees, and everyone spoke kindly about the Japanese ship. Uh, whereas some of the American ships were refusing to pick up uh, survivors who had swam to the ship and were instead lifting off cargo, which is a horrible thing to think. And they know. weren't picking up... I mean, they refused, absolutely refused. Which, which because Admiral implied. Bristol had sent word that uh, no American ship should give any aid and comfort to the enemies of the Turks, even though this little enemy might have been a 10-year-old boy strong enough to swim out to the ship. And who was um, Admiral, Admiral uh, Bristol? Admiral in, uh, Bristol was our ranking diplomatic representative. Nobody had declared uh, war against, we hadn't declared war against Turkey, but the other countries had. And like the other countries, we had not re-established diplomatic uh, representation. So. Everybody had a high commissioner. There was a Greek high commissioner yeah. of, uh, you know, of all of these. Is this and the Admiral, Admiral Bristol was our high commissioner. And was he stationed in Constantinople? Yes, he was. And he was from Constantinople sending dispatches back to the State Department. Now, he was now, also was he acting dispatched? as the head of the... Or was he getting dispatches? Of the, 
he was getting dispatches and from his intelligence in officers. And these dispatches said what? And they said the Turks are running around burning Smyrna. And he then turned around and reported to the State Department that uh, the city was burning, but the Turks had nothing to do with it, that they were trying to put the fires out. And so this was very confusing to me mm -hmm. when I would read one thing mm -hmm. coming out of Smyrna and mm -hmm. the other thing coming, and I couldn't understand what his motive was. Well, his motive was that he was working really for Standard Oil, mm -hmm. and he was also very pro-Turkish for that reason, and he hated the British, and he had this thought that if the British, uh, the, he thought the British were pro-Greek, and the Americans all thought the British were pro-Greek. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the British were trying also to go back on their word with the Greeks and to help Ataturk. So I want to read something else apropos of what you're talking about. This is page six of your book, and it says, uh, uh, this is um, a scanning of the New York Times and microfilm for the days following September 9th. I found the following headlines and lead story on September 15, 1922. Smyrna burning, 14 Americans missing, 1,000 massacred as Turks fire a city, Kemal threatens march on capital, our consulate destroyed. Now, uh, I mean, I studied history in, in grade school, I studied, studied it in high school, and I also was required to study history in college. And uh, nowhere uh, was I ever told anything about the, this heinous crime that happened in Smyrna? So it seems as though there was some kind of conspiracy of silence mm -hmm. among all the Western powers. And I'm trying to get at why was there this conspiracy of silence? What was there? What was happening that allowed uh, this tragedy to happen? Yeah, I spent, uh, you know, seven years researching this book and a considerable amount of time trying to sort out these particular... I mean, here is a man sending a report and saying the Turks are putting kerosene on the buildings, Turks in uniform, and setting torches to them. They have waited until the wind has shifted away from the Turkish quarter so that it won't... You know, usually the wind comes in from the ocean. Yes, that's right. So, at this point, they waited until the wind was blowing toward the sea. There was a shift of wind, and at that point, they could start below. Let's say the Turkish quarter is here. Mm -hmm. You start just below it, which was the Armenian quarter, where they had slaughtered so many Armenians that the whole quarter stank. It was very hot, mm. and the bodies on the streets were smelling up a storm. The ships, uh, people were carrying the... the I, I got this from the uh, men on shore patrol that I tracked down. The American 52 were landed, and I was able to find 11 of these men who were still with it, and mm. uh, most of them have since died because this is already 20 years ago. But the point is that they had to do something with this situation, and they decided to burn them out, and that way get rid of the uh, uh, the, the Greeks as well. So you see... The Greek population was a great problem, leaving 400,000 people there. So they started the so fire. It, it burned enough, the Greek you're quarter. It was not enough that the that the Greek troops uh, the Greek troops left. You're saying that uh, the the Turkish army at this time wanted to get rid of Greek citizens. They wanted to clean wanted Turkey to clean for it. the Turks. In fact, and after that, you yourself. know, there was an evacuation of over a million Greeks from Eastern Thrace, who. Ernest Hemingway. Eastern Thrace. Well, Eastern Thrace is somewhere in, I mean, Western Thrace. Western Sorry, Thrace. Western yes, Thrace. Western point, Thrace yeah. is is this area, I think. And the the thing is, they had to trudge in uh, through the mud. They a lot of them went off to uh, they went to Greece. Yes. But uh, they I guess ships picked them up finally, and they went to some of the Greek but islands. There was a million, Many of them a settled Greeks. in Salonika. Ah. Uh, so Did you point to Thessalonica because it's important yeah, nowadays too. This is Thrace, and all the Greeks had to leave it. That's a lot of people. Uh, over a million. Certainly so they cleaned certainly. out. They had already murdered all the Armenians during the war. It was a sort of a forerunner of the genocide of, of the Jews in World War II. Well, that brings me to another... Uh, uh, so now they got rid of the Greeks. Another paraphrase that, that is attributed to Hitler uh, when Hitler was contemplating his, his uh, Holocaust against the Jews and uh, any political dissidents and Catholics and gypsies and 
and uh, foreign nationals who he captured when he's planning this Holocaust. Uh, uh, he was uh, quoted to have said, "Well, uh, this may be uh, bad publicity for us, and maybe the world will will condemn us for it." And Hitler was supposed to have said, "Well, who remembers the Armenians?" Yeah, he what, said what it. All he, right, it's in there. Or is this the uh, book no, you wrote? That's also? The, oh. Yeah. After uh, I found I found this quote this with is the help of Hitler and the Armenian genocide. Right, okay. but. Uh, this one man that I was interviewing said, you know, I read somewhere that Hitler said this. I said, if we could just find the quote. Mm -hmm. I was at that time, I was doing an article for commentary uh -huh. on the Armenian genocide. Just an article. The Times wouldn't publish it after they bought it uh -huh. upstairs. They, the Times is unbelievably pro-Turkish, mm -hmm. even back then. Huh. And the Turks exert censorship, which bothers me very much. I'm talking, of course, about the Turkish government and leadership. They have been exerting censorship on... American, well, willing to be censored, obviously. And uh, so they, I published this in this commentary article. And after that, there was a big brouhaha from the Turkish uh, officials mm -hmm. saying that it was a total lie. He'd never said that. So a Harvard professor did a study and put out this monograph which proves that Hitler did. They got it from three separate sources. The one I got came from... Um, the head of the Associated Press in Germany uh, during the war, before we got into the war, well, World War II, and Hitler was, did. Yeah. Hitler, you know, well, actually, being who he was, I don't doubt that he said something. Oh, he like said that. that. But and I want to get more closely now. It's more important to me. What was this genocide against the Armenians that happened? When did it happen, and how many people were killed? And well, why do you think it did happen? My conservative place? estimates, it was still over a million, over a million. Armenians. There in were only period. two and a half million Armenians in all of Turkey, yeah. so that's a lot of people. That's, that's a, uh, that's and a, yeah. they, what they did is... Uh, when did this happen? 1915. 1915. Now, over Armenia... Period, over a year, two years, three years? 1915, and it petered out in 16. It so was done very efficiently. A little over a year, a million and a half Armenians were killed. Right. And what do you think was the motivation for killing? Well, there's that many large motivations, but they did want to uh, thrust. There was a whole movement which this government of the Young Turks subscribed to, but hadn't announced officially. It was still the that, Ottoman Empire at that time. They had no. Warrior. The Young Turks came in in 1907 and uh, took over the government. It may have been no six uh -huh. or oh, yeah. Even though it was called the Ottoman government, there was really it was uh, they they, they deposed the group. Sultan. So it was supposed to be a democratic revolution. Uh -huh. And they had they a revolution. The they deposed the Sultan. In what who year? went into exile. Do you know do you know the year? Uh, in 1907. Seven, I so think. It was before the first yeah. war, oh, yeah. he was deposed. Mm -hmm. and they were it may have been 1906, I'm supposedly sorry. Supposedly installing a democratic government. Yes, and, and they the came in on the slogan of liberty, one, fraternity, and, you know, the and French... And they proceeded to kill one and a half million Armenians. That was, uh, came, well, within ten years, Yes, they did, yes. under cloak of war, just as Hitler. Hitler learned a lot from this. This was a test run for mm -hmm. him. For one thing, there were Germans there. You do know that most of... The Hitler's general staff were lieutenants and captains during World War One in Turkey. No, I they had know. Mengele. We talk about Mengele and the atrocities that they did on the doctors, did on the children and the mm -hmm. experiments. Yes. Yeah. Well, they, the Turkish doctors were doing that in uh, Turkey on the Armenians. Uh, there have been studies of this by very, very qualified people. But once again, what was the motivation to kill? that many people of one ethnic group, one country, why were they doing this? They were the only ones left who didn't, hadn't broken away for the, from the Ottoman Empire. The Greeks broke away in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. the Bulgarians, they, they, all of these were preceded by terrible bloodbaths and, and so forth. The Armenians had been treated abominably under Sultan Abdul, Abdul Hamid I, even before that. In the, throughout the 19th century, they were treated badly. So what was feared was that they're going to break away too. And there were voices. See, the Armenians had one very great disadvantage. Half of the population of Armenians in the world lived on the Russian side of the fr frontier. The other part uh, lived, the, the uh, other half lived in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Then there were a handful scattered in the world. But those on the Russian side during the war were fighting against Turkey. 
Turkey used this as an excuse to claim that the Armenians in Turkey were conniving with the Armenians uh, in Russia. Now that, they say, so they were trying up here in this area, uh, this is ancient Armenia, yes. but they're trying to establish liaison and, and be traitors to the war effort. The fact is they cleaned out every Armenian from this areas the only two places they left Armenians intact except for the leaders whom they sent off on April 24th to their deaths were April in Smyrna of, of 1915 right. they left the Armenian population of Smyrna and Constantinople alone that's because there were many foreigners in both of those cities who would have witnessed this, and they were still trying to pretend that they weren't going to do anything. Mm -hmm. The word soon got out, though. My mother's family had originally been from Izmit, which is near the Sea of Maimara here. That's as far from the frontier here uh, with uh, Russia as you'd like to be. They were all sent to their deaths. Uh, the rest of them escaped to Smyrna. Uh, they my father's family come from the Mediterranean near Musada, that region, which became a medieval Armenian kingdom uh, at one point. But that, they were all killed. Now, that's none of this is near there, and that just does not hold up that, that uh, excuse, if it's an excuse, no, just because some people may be excuse, near the frontier, the but whatever, there's no the excuse region, for wiping excuse. out all the army. So they did that. The other thing is they had a desire to thrust eastward and pick up, as they're doing right now, by the way, pick up all of those Turkic republics uh, along the southern rim of Russia. They wanted an empire thrusting eastward as long as they'd lost their empire in the west. So what do you have to do then and now to get over and start going eastward and picking them up? You have to step over the Armenians or eliminate mm, them uh, on both sides of the frontier. Yes, I see. They also, there was some of the usual uh, feeling that the Armenians were too, uh, too good at trade and, you know, they didn't all that stuff. Well, I think you've cleared that up for me. Thank you very much. I want to get back to this point of the conspiracy of silence. And I think our time is running a little short. I just want to uh, clear this up, if you can, for us. Yeah. Why the great powers, as I read uh, the, the uh, New York Times, uh, dated September 15, 1922, in which they said, uh, there were uh, uh, a thousand mass massacred, Turks were setting fire to the city. Now, the New York Times didn't follow up with this. Uh, it wasn't the cause celeb for any, for any of the uh, papers or any, any politicians that I know that I read about. Right. So what, who had the power to conspire to dampen the, uh, the uh, notoriety of these horrible events? And well, why? first of all, I have to explain that in, uh, Admiral Bristol up there was working with Alan Dulles, who had been his chief of staff and who had been sent to the State Department to become chief of the, of the Near East desk, which included mostly, you know, Turkey, Mesopotamia, all that was part of uh, the Ottoman, what had yes. been the Ottoman Empire. Yes. It was under Turkey then. Yes. Now, when he was sitting there, during the Greco-Turkish War and all the fighting that preceded, there were no roads, you know, through mm -hmm. from from Smyrna through the interior up there. You went by rail. The rail lines had all been cut. So the only way correspondents could get down there mm -hmm. was on Navy ships. Yes. And to get down on Navy ships, you needed to have the okay, if you were an American, of Admiral Bristol. You had to have his okay. Oh, and he says in his own letters, which I read, he says, and I told these men, there were two of them, that they could go, but they would have to look after my interests. Mm. And they knew what his interests were. So after a, about a day or two, that he was close they to had to one. use the Navy ship's radio to get yeah. their stories out, too. Oh, these are the reporters. You're the reporters. Ah, so I two see. days later, they got the word, you're not going to be able to send those ah, stories. So they, one reporter so said to the other. to have a story that's slightly shaded in one way rather than to have no story Well, they just turned around and said, uh, well, the Turks are doing everything to put the fires out. And I'm saying to myself, whatever is going on here? Yeah. Two days ago, they're saying one thing. Now, our American consul was so outraged yes. that he came out and wrote a book about it. 
and he denounced and he had That's to retire. Mr. Mr. Horton. Yes, he was really a splendid man of great conscience and he was sitting and signing passes to allow anybody who who was even Greek or Armenian or anyone to get on a, an American ship right up until the back of the consulate was burning and they finally pulled him out and he had to get on board. Uh, when they got on board, the captain of the ship put off all the Armenians and Greeks and wouldn't let them on. There were some heroic attempts though and, and lives saved. But I must say that Admiral Bristol had it really sewed up that the whole story got turned around. It is my feeling that he initiated that, that the Americans were the first to do the big cover-up. And how closely and, uh, can you connect him with any oil company or... Well, he or was working for company? his... He said it's wonderful to have Alan Dulles down there leading the... the uh, so he was working with Alan Dulles, who was a uh, working hand-in-glove with Charles Evans Hughes. And I read the oil histories of the Standard Oil Charles Company. Evans Hughes was is our, he, well, he became later the, you know, the Chief Justice of the United States, but he was at this point, point the Secretary of State. Okay. And he had worked as Chief Vice President of Standard Oil. That's what I'm saying. And the get. Standard okay. Oil history okay. said, never has the Standard Oil Company made so much progress mm. as it did in the years when Charles Evans Hughes was Secretary of State. So How about the other countries, uh, Britain? Well, they all fell in line. See, they were all, it's really quite a, a whodunit in there. It's too mm -hmm. bad that the Turks won't allow, again, their censorship to have this filmed because it would make the most dramatic story. After the war, in those years between 1920 and 19. 23 when Ataturk won, there were all of these in, in Arabia and all that area, we had spies roaming around for all the different mm. oil companies mm. and each one, each the French were in there and the British were in there and the Americans were in there and each one wanted to get the exploitation rights to those oil fields. So they leaned over backwards, by the way, to help uh, Ataturk to win. I mean, uh, the British... Uh, were sort of quietly doing it, but the French openly made a treaty with him finally. So did the Italians. It's interesting that the French and the Italians were much kinder officially to the uh, victims of the burning of Smyrna than were the uh, countries that had been less overtly uh, on his side. The French were working with him with Ataturk. The Italians were working with Ataturk, and they did not care about uh, offending him, which was not an offense at all, to take people on the ships and uh, save their lives if they came out to the ship. Now, you, you mentioned um, uh, Camille Ad Ataturk. His first, uh, his actual name is Mustafa, Mustafa Kemal. Kemal Ataturk. Ataturk means father of the Turks. I see. And uh, uh, now, you mentioned in his book, in your book rather, um, that he had sort of pangs of guilt. If I can just again quote this is from page 15 of your book, uh, Smyrna 1922, The Destruction of a City. It has recently come to my attention that Mustafa Kemal, uh, Kemal Ataturk himself acknowledged the attempted extermination of Armenians conducted in 1915-1916 and summarized in chapter 2 as part of the historical background of events leading to the sack and burning of Smyrna in this book, of course. In an interview with Swiss journalist Emil Hildebrand, published in the Los Angeles Examiner. Yeah, it was. Oh. August 1st. You have the, oh, you have a copy of it? Well, I have a copy. I don't know how it'll look up there. But uh, I, I just want to just finish the quote. Yeah. Uh, uh, Los Angeles Examiner of uh, August 1st, 1926, uh, Kemal referred to political antagonists as these leftovers from the former Young Turkey uh, Party who should have been made to account for the lives of the millions of our Christian subjects who were ruthlessly driven en masse from their homes and massacred. Paradoxically, while continuing to revere Kemal as founder of the Turkish Republic and their foremost national hero, successive Turkish governments, including the one currently in power, also continue to revere Talat, the leader of the Young Turk Party, an architect of the Armenian Genocide. Right, and they're to this day also denying that they burned Smyrna 
and uh, they have a leg to stand on. What really is upsetting me these days mm -hmm. is in terms of the Armenians, they're, they're killing them every winter by putting a terrible blockade between Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey, and we get no publicity whatever because we have to be friendly to Turkey. At the same time, we have now got Ataturk chairs of uh, professorships at places like Princeton, UCLA, and many other colleges, they're picking up these Ataturk chairs, and they have, you know, these are first-rate universities. Up the chairs. I, mean, I mean, the Turks, Turks. are paying the yeah. university to put in a chair ah, professorship right. with supposedly first-rate scholars who, on these questions, continue to deny, who say that the Greeks burn Smyrna and try to make some phony uh, half excuse by taking what Admiral Bristol said and said, oh, they couldn't have burned it, you know, they were trying to put the fires out, well, and not giving the, the story. You're saying the Turkish government endows these chairs, mm -hmm. and they have perhaps a majority voice in saying who will and who will, exactly. who will uh, sit and they, in these chairs. They have works published. And become puppets for the for They the absolutely government. do. There's uh, Right now, mm. there's a man in uh, who has been denying, I've come to uh, grips with him in a correspondence in which he's denying constantly that the Turks didn't, they see he says the Turks didn't burn it. Why? And the excuse is, why would the Turks burn their own second greatest city? Well, why indeed? You know, they say you, they'd have to be crazy. Well, so be it. I mean, they did it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think myself that Ataturk was wanted that city burned. I think they were having this raggle-taggle army was being given their seven days and nights of orgy. And it's really kind of a rerun of the sack of Constantinople in 1453. First they looted, and then they raped, and then they, they murdered, and then it went crazy, and then they burned. But the one of the things that's interesting is that after this was all over, and Ataturk didn't even want to see the burning. He, they say he averted his eyes. Well, you know, that could, is or is not. But he gave medals and commendations to all of the men who served on the Turkish Greco War, of course, for the Turks. And he did not give, and he really cut out this man who was in charge of Smyrna. So, so I, he personally I think he personally found this quite dreadful. Yeah, yes, that happened in Smyrna. I mean, it was it a crazy like thing to burn your own. Yes, by, uh, by it was, right and also day. to get rid of people. He was going to clean up and get rid of the. I, I don't think he was against getting the people out of Thrace. I, I, I want to. I, I know you. You are of Armenian background, uh, by your name, Hausapian, and I want to know how you feel uh, with regard to the Turkish people in general. You hold well, them responsible? No, I or? think that the, 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 the policies of the government, to me, because they have been excused for all of their dreadful deeds, beginning with the Disraeli and even before when the British wanted to run their empire for them there, uh, I don't think that the leadership of Turkey has much come out of the Middle Ages. They have been pretending to be very uh, forward and, you know, they wash, instead of washing their faces, they put cosmetics with the help of 12 public relations firms mm -hmm. here and abroad. But the people of Turkey are, are like people anywhere else. And I think that they're, most of them suffer mightily. And we have also, you know, they have the worst human rights record on earth, according both to Helsinki Watch and Amnesty mm -hmm. International. And some of the prisoners there are Turkish prisoners of conscience. Mm -hmm. So the people are, I mean, after all, Germany relapsed into barbarity and we're all capable of that. But I don't think they ever stopped. That's the point. And I don't think they've really shown that they've come to grips with their own past. Well, certainly. By denying it. Yeah, if they deny this. this yes. Uh, and there's no hope. And we're continuing to excuse it. Mm -hmm. And I blame the Americans every bit as much as yes. the Turks and the other European powers who all fell into line after taking mm -hmm. the lead of the Americans. Well, do you think now that, that our current uh, a close relationship with Turkey is still based upon oil or is it based upon. No, it's taken alliance? on a life of its, its own. It's now munitions. 
It's now munitions, and uh, they are stirring up trouble. If they can't get to, into Europe one way, they're going to do it another. They're Meaning stirring the up Turks? trouble. Meaning yeah, the, the Turks? Turks, do you know that we have incredible munitions factories? Boeing has factories in the interior of Turkey. Nobody, you don't read it uh, in too many places, but I happen to have a list of the contractors who are working in Turkey. Mm. Chevron Oil is now in Azerbaijan, and Turkey is kind of big brother to Azerbaijan, trying to kill the Armenians in Armenia. Mm.